So with that, Paul, I'm only five minutes over, but I'm uh, ready for questions or however else you want to do this. So okay, I... uh, we're in pretty good shape. We're, we're, I'm gonna have, I got some questions in the chat box that I would, would ask you. And then I think we'll have the ability for people to unmute and act, ask direct uh, when we get through that. So the first one is, is just about the neighbor's field. Is it uh, just a conventional or is it conventional with covers, no covers, just to have a clarification. Yeah, so uh, all of the neighbor's fields were some type of conventional tillage and there was no cover crop. So it, it, it varied. Um, we, yeah, and we did not have a neighbor field for all of our 12 farmer sites, which was a limitation, but there were no cover crops and it was not no-till. Okay, uh, Ed has a question. Is water infiltration rate equal to the soil hydraulic conductivity? Well, they're, they're similar. Uh, as a soil physicist, we would typically measure them slightly differently. Infiltration focuses uh, primarily on the water getting into the surface. Hydraulic conductivity focuses primarily on the permeability of the soil below the surface. But if you, if you have a, if you, <laughs> they're related, right? If, uh, if you have a high infiltration rate, but then the conductivity is very low, uh, the infiltrate eventually water can't get into the soil surface. So, so they're related, but they're not, they're not exactly the same. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question, uh, in the Indiana sites, which cover crops were planted? Do you know what species of cover oh, crops were planted yeah. in those sites? They were all different. Um, so that's why I couldn't go into that level of detail. Um, I should have put down here, we have uh, individual reports on the um, CCSI Indiana website, so ccsin.org. We do have individual reports from each of the farmer sites. Um, there are certainly cereal rye was a very common one, but we had um, a mixture of things. So we had, well, you saw them on the rulons. We had annual ryegrass, cereal rye, oats, radish. Um, others had, um, a lot of them had annual ryegrass. We had some that had uh, rapeseed. We had some that have the cocktail mix, which is, of course, 12 or 13 or 14 different species. So they all varied. And that is one of the issues with trying to make um, big generalizations from our site is that we didn't ask them all to do the same thing, for better or worse. Okay. I'm trying to work down through these questions here. Uh, can one distinguish P. solubilizing bacteria or fungi from the total? Not, uh, I don't think the, no, the, the, at least the PLFA test does not do that. It's got total bacteria, it's got gram positive and gram negative, uh, it's got mycorrhizal fungi, um, it has uh, saprophytic fungi, but it does not have P. solubilizing bacteria, no. And I, I have to say that the PL, if there's any soil biologists on here that want to jump in and, and add more, that's great. But the PLFA test, when I got them, I was shocked, not being a soil biologist, I was shocked to see that half of the organisms that uh, go into the biomass that PLFA does are undetermined, right? So it's a little better than using culture plates uh, to identify organisms, but there's still a lot of them that, that are undetermined, what, the, what they are, who they are. Okay, uh, moving on down. How many reps were done of the different bio tests on each sample, each soil sample? So in, we collected, um, so, so we had three reps in the field, right? We had three cover crop, three no cover crop strips, or four. We sampled from three of them because of the costs. Um, we sent those samples in and I don't know what the lab did, right? So I don't know when the lab got our bag from replicate one of the uh, DeSutter cover crop. I don't know if they weighed out one sample or, or two. I, I don't know the lab procedures on that, but we had three replicates from the field for the cover and three replicates from the field for the no cover. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, Natalie has a question. Has the time of day ever been examined to see if it has any influence on the results, like moisture differences uh, during the time of the day, how it might affect the biota? Uh, not that I'm aware of, no. <laughs> we don't even, the, we have enough of a trouble, you know, trying to, to, uh, to determine the time of year that we ought to say up a let alone the time of day. But I mean, it, it could, it, it certainly could, but uh, I'm, I'm not aware of anybody having looked at that. Okay, uh, Jim has a question. Can you use organic matter levels in a field as a proxy for the various specific biological and chemical health processes? Mostly not, unfortunately. That's what we would love to, to have. But it, the, or, the organic matter level in the field is, is certainly going to affect some of those uh, parameters, um, like uh, really some of the physical parameters, available water capacity and, and aggregate stability. Um, but not, not so much for these biological things that are very uh, dynamic and are related more. They're related more to the food that's available now. So stable organic matter isn't really food for them so much as it's, um, it helps maintain soil moisture and, and uh, buffer variations in, in moisture. Um, but that's the rationale for something like active carbon is to try to get at that um, newer carbon that's readily available for organisms as opposed to old carbon that buffers the system but doesn't really provide any food. Okay, the questions are just coming in, Eileen, so we're going to keep going. <laughs> well, it's okay, okay because you know how technology works is we're not having a very good luck being able to put people into different rooms. So we're just getting a bunch of questions coming into the chat box. So we're just going to keep rolling here. Okay, uh, sure. And, and they're all, all good. Uh, any suggestion for farmers to choose the lab? As you mentioned, the variations in the tests, farmers we interview also mentioned that different soil test labs provide different results. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it depends. Of course, it depends. <laughs> um, one of the things that I, um, the, I kind of like the Cornell test from the standpoint of it has physical, chemical, and biological, whereas the PLFA test is strictly biological. I think it's going to be really cool, but I don't know how to interpret it yet. And uh, the Haney test, um, I don't think has, has, um, necessarily been shown to be a very good predictor of fertility needs in the in the Midwest. The thing about the Cornell test, though, is that it does, um, uh, the fertility test on the Cornell test is not what we would typically use in, well, depending on where you are in the Midwest, right? Um, I mean, we use Bray or Malik, um, and they, they use other extractants. And so um, the fertility recommendations from the Cornell test may or may not apply. Um, in certain parts of, in much of the Midwest. So another option is to not, um, the Cornell test, you can do all 12 measures for a certain price. I think it's 110, maybe it's changed now. Or you can do some, uh, what you call a la carte. And if you, if you send your normal soil fertility samples, I mean, a lot of people in Indiana send them to a and labs, for example, that's just one. Right, and they get their fertility recommendations from that, um, or from the uh, tri-state uh, recommendations based on those results. But what you don't get with that is you don't get the active carbon, the the um, ACE protein, which is is on uh, uh, mineralizable nitrogen. You don't get the respiration. So you could do a la carte for Cornell for some of those if you want some of those other tests. Now, of course, you won't get that pretty bingo sheet that's got your overall score. Um, so it, it really kind of depends on what you want. What I'm suggesting to people, if they, if they just want a little bit of soil health, uh, stuff as to see whether they're improving over time, you could either do the whole test or you could do active carbon respiration and ACE protein, um, and then come back two years later and four years later and, and see how those are, are changing. Um, so it really kind of depends on the purpose. That's not a very good answer, but. I, I was going to sneak a question in ahead of the cut. I was going to cut the line and, and ask you, and I think you just answered the three about if you were going to 
if you were going to pick uh, indicators, do a la carte, which three or four would you pick? Yeah, I, I would. Yeah, I would pick active carbon, respiration, probably uh, you know, on the Cornell one, the ACE protein, because that gets at the nitrogen. Um, those are the three that I would look at. Um, the Cornell one has penetrometer in it, but you have to do that anyway, right? So you can, you can do that. And if you do it at the wrong time of year, I don't think that's very helpful. Uh, available water capacity is determined mostly by texture, a little bit by changes in organic matter, but that's pretty slow. Um, aggregate stability is another one. I'm not totally, uh, I don't like their method as well as the method I use in my lab, but, <laughs> but I understand why they do do that method because it's easier to do, you know, for large numbers of samples. So that would be if I was adding a fourth one, I'd probably add that one. But and what do you you what test do you use in your lab? Well, you can't just throw that out there. <laughs> oh well, okay, okay. Well, I use the um, it's uh, it it basically it, it's the Kemper and Chepel method, which is based on the Yoder method, which is like 80 years old, but it's really good. It basically takes the aggregates and it doesn't crush them first; it just pushes them through an eight millimeter sieve, and then it oscillates them in a tank of water on a nest of four sieves up and down, and and it's very time consuming, but um, I think it's a better test than what they do. They crush everything to two millimeter before they do their test. And then they do a rainfall thing, which is fine, but they crush, in my opinion, they crush the aggregates that I'm most interested in. Perfect, thank you. Uh, <laughs> Gary has Gary has a, a question. If, if we want to measure and compare aggregate stability in a no-till field that uses cover crops with a conventional tillage field, when is the best time to sample for this as long as it's, it is the same time? Yeah, um, the soil needs to be moist and the soil needs to have had some time for biological activity um, to have occurred during that, uh, during that season. So I used to make, on my own research, I used to do measurements in April and then again in, in uh, June or July. A lot of times the April measurements were were very low, right? Because it's just coming out of winter and there's not been a whole lot of biological activity to build the aggregates. So I would say in, in June when it's moist, however, right? So don't, you know, if it's a year where it starts getting bone dry um, by mid-June, do it, do it before it gets bone dry. <laughs> Or do it after, a, you know, after a, a, rain, a good rainfall and give it a couple of days. But I would say, you know, mid-June would be a good time, as long as it's moist. Okay, thank you. Uh, Daryl has a question. Have the results of your evaluations of the various soil health tests been shared with those that provide the test to get their reaction to the findings? Well, that's an excellent question. No. <laughs> Uh, no, we haven't done that actually. That was actually, I think, on our original, our an original plan to um, maybe have some conversations with them, but we we have not done that. Good thought. I don't know if I'll follow up on that or not, but that's a good that's a good thought. I'll I'll write it down to remind me that I had originally intended to do that. <laughs> uh, the next question is from Eric, and I think you sort of answered it, but. Uh... I'm going to respect and ask his question. Uh, farmers are constrained by budgets. If they are to do more testing on their own, what one component of these tests do you highly recommend for practicality and cost? Well, if it's, on, if it's only one test, you're really kind of limited. Um, you know, I, I guess at this point, I would probably I'd probably think about the active carbon. That's a one ad hoc test from, uh, or a la carte test from uh, Cornell. It costs 20 bucks. Um, that's, if I had to choose one, that's probably the one I would choose. Because it gets at that food source. Again, there's a lot of variability in it and, and people are not sure whether it's actually going to end up being that definitive or not because of the snapshot nature of it. Um, 
that it could change, you know, in, in two weeks, it could change based on what are the root exudates doing, what's the weather doing, and things like that. So I would never recommend these things as a, that you would do grid sampling, that you would do it as intensely as you do soil fertility. I mean, I would, I would stick with doing the soil fertility, and then if you want to do a few other things, I would probably choose active carbon as the single, as the single measure at this, at this point with what we know at this point. Okay, uh, Charles has a question. Do you think one of these tests will eventually become a preferred test or will they all remain relevant? I think it's gonna be quite a while before we get to a preferred test based on the fact that, um, well, especially the biology, we're learning a lot. You know, we're really in the infancy of these tests um, and you know, the Soil Health Institute and uh, ARS um, and others have come up with the tier one, tier two, tier three measures for soil health. And tier one measurements are more even than the ones I, I uh, talked about. And NRCS um, is part of that as well. Um, so for people who are going to do an exhaustive study, uh, in fact, I think the CIG call that they have right now wants people to do all of the tier one measurements. So if in fact that can be done well enough and all the data can be compiled well enough, at some point there might be some better guidance on which one or two of those really is the most important. Um, but I, I, don't think, I don't think we're anywhere close to having um, the preferred test in my opinion. Okay, uh, Stefan has a question. At the end of the day, what do these expensive test results mean to a farmer? Can the results inform how he or she reduces fertilizer, reduces pesticides, improves yield, uh, et cetera? Uh, yeah, that's an excellent question. And, and we were hoping for more definitive results that we could tell farmers, yes, this, this test is really, really great. I, I find that uh, there's two different tracks, I guess, on that answer. One is some people just want to have something that documents that, in fact, their adoption of conservation practices is actually improving their soil, which over the long term will improve productivity at reduced input, right? Over the long term, I stress, right? But if you increase organic matter and increase water holding capacity and you increase biological activity, um, then hopefully you will either get greater yields for the same inputs or you'll be able to reduce, uh, I'm talking fertilizer inputs primarily, um, and maybe you'll have better pest control if you have better biological activity. So the tests are partially to help document and give confidence that yes, I'm actually making progress. My system is improving. Um, but specifically what you can do to decrease inputs, that's kind of the idea with the Haney test, but the stuff that I've seen in the Midwest, it, it has not been, it's not something that I would um, recommend to farmers that they use that in order to reduce fertilizer rates at this point in time with the with the inconsistencies in the in the midwestern soils where it's been been tested so um these are not tests i should say maybe that i recommend but when a farmer asks me i want to document i want to know something about whether my soil is imp improving or not then i say well okay if you want to take a few spots take a few tests measure it every two years or so to see whether things are improving but um these are not something that I think most farmers need to be doing right now. Okay, uh, Frida has a question. Does any of the tests you mentioned measure soil enzyme beta glucosase, glutase? If not, why? Yeah, uh, the, the current tests uh, do not measure enzymes, beta gl glucosidase and, and uh, any of the other enzymes. Certainly there are researchers who are working on enzymes. And if you look at the tier one measures, 
well, I don't remember if they're tier one or they're tier two, but again, what ARS and the Soil Health Institute and NRCS are looking at, enzymes are one of their, their measures. None of the three that I talked about measure enzymes. Um, I think you can get enzymes uh, run by the, uh, so one of the labs that we used for PLFA was the Missouri Soil Health Lab, and I believe they have enzymes. Um, so if you want to have enzymes measured, you can get them. But at the time that we started this project in 2012, the, the enzyme measurements were not part of the suite of soil health measures that, that people were looking at for practical farmer um, application. Okay, um, I've got a question. As, a, as an extension educator, um, you had mentioned active carbon is an important test. What about these in-field active carbon tests versus the lab? Uh, what do you, how do you feel about those as that snapshot where we, we just take dry soil and do an in-field active carbon test? There's some of the kits. I know uh, Ohio State University had developed one. Um, they're, they're okay for what they are. Um, we, we actually, I sent a couple of my guys over there uh, a couple of years ago to, to talk with uh, Rafiq about that and they got some of the kits. Um, and I think they're good as far as they go, but the, if you look at the ranges of the colors, you know, anytime you have a color indicator, it's a big range. So I don't think um, for what we were interested in, it, it wasn't, it wasn't precise enough. Uh, it was, and I don't, I don't remember, was the range 250 or 300 parts per million, but it was a pretty big range. So all of ours were going to be in this one range. And maybe that is exactly as it should be, because maybe it doesn't matter <laughs> if, it's, if it's in this 250 part per million range, whether it's 251 or, or 499 may not matter. I, I don't know. But um, so it could give, I think it could give a really quick indication of, of uh, gross differences. But if you want something a little bit better then a lab measurement's gonna be better. Okay, thank you. Um, that is all the questions that was in the chat box. I think is if anybody has a question, they can unmute their mic and ask it. I think you have that ability. If you'd like to do that, uh, now's the time. Hi, this is Vicki Marone from Michigan State. I'm just wondering, I'm thinking about, I've read some literatures talking about suggesting farmers test a fence post area to compare it to his or her field to see how close he is to, you know, the original uh, soil value. What do you think about that approach or do you, what values do you see in it? Yeah, um, that's something that actually we talk about in, in many of our um, uh, soil health trainings and, and so on with farmers. Um, it's, it's good in the sense of that's an area that has been relatively undisturbed for a long time. Typically, they are not sprayed bare, right? So typically, there's all kinds of things growing in, in, um, in a fence row. Uh, it's been undisturbed tillage wise. It's got a lot of different things growing, a lot of different species growing. Um, so it gives some indication of what that soil could be like um, and what your, not as, I don't want to say it's your end goal, but that's at least an intermediate goal that you ought to be able to get your soil back into a condition that's somewhat like that fence post. And, and um, I know that <clears throat> some of my colleagues uh, in NRCS talk about, you know, when fence rows are taken out and people look at yield monitors and they see this tremendous yield, it, linear features in the field, tremendous yield for years afterwards. What is that? It's the old fence row. So, so I think it's a good, uh, you know, oh gosh, I could really improve this active carbon. You know, I could double the active carbon because look at what it is in the fence row. It, it gives you some idea of what you might be able to achieve. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, uh, Eileen, thank you very much for, for sharing with us today and being with us and sharing that information. It was very beneficial. Uh, You're welcome. 